three. Welcome to another episode of The Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with theater's biggest talents. Today we have Tony-nominated actress, singer, and songwriter, born and raised in New York City, uh, started her career in the music biz- business as one half of the pop R&B duo Orin Moore uh, on EMI Records, and then went on to great success on Broadway, made your debut in Footloose the Musical, now you're in Pretty Woman the <laughs> Musical, Orfe. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me today. No problem. Thank you. Uh, so you've been, you were, I said, you were born and raised in New York. Uh, what was being a kid in New York like for you compared to uh, what it is what it is for kids now? Gosh, I, you know, I don't, I don't much have a frame of reference as to what it's like for the kids now. I imagine it was safer when I was a kid. Safer how? Well, just like, you could, I, I was a latchkey kid. I was riding the subway by myself like when I was 10. And we all were. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so I don't know, but I, I wouldn't trade it for any other kind of a childhood. I went to public school. Again, I rode the subway really young. Um, we were, we were, uh, we were tough, scrappy kids, you know? And, um, I loved it. I loved it. I still love it. Uh, clearly, I'm still here. And it, it, was a, it was a good group. It was a good group. It was a good time, you know, so. And how, uh, how exposed, I guess, were, were you to music and theater at that point in your life? Well, here's the thing. City kids don't really go to theater. At least I know we didn't because city kids' parents try to get them out of the city every chance they get. Mm-hmm. So a weekend excursion wouldn't necessarily be 10 blocks west and up, you know what I mean, or right. down, depending on where you lived. So it wasn't the thing that we did. Uh, our parents generally would send us away to summer camp, sleep away, mm-hmm. <laughs> get us again, get us out of the city. Or weekends would be more like getting out of the city to, you know, go skiing or go somewhere where there was, you know, grass and things of that nature. Uh, we skied a lot. That was our thing. Um, So that's really what it was. I started to be introduced more to theater and plays and off-Broadway. My best friend's mom was really into it. So once I was in um, junior high and high school, she would come to town. She lived in Los Angeles. My best friend was from Los Angeles, went to school in New York with me. And her mom started to get into it. And I saw everything in like a rapid succession of, you know, binge, binge theater watching. So that was that was what um, I got to do as a teen. So I, I saw everything from Darlene Love in the Rink to the original Penn and Teller to the original um, Signs of Intelligent Life with Lily Tomlin mm-hmm. and, and literally everything in between, you know, from Speed the Plow to Leader of the Pack to everything. So that was my big I think as a kid, I definitely saw Annie because I don't think there was a kid in in the world that didn't see Annie. Right. I saw I got to see the original cast with Andrew McArdle. So yeah, I mean, again, it wasn't what you did as a city kid, as a native. Mm-hmm. You they tried to get you out. <laughs> so so when you got into theater, did your did your group of friends change, or did you do that with uh, with your friend's mom, or I guess she and she and her mom? <laughs> I. My my group of friends hasn't actually changed. I have certainly, I've been in theater for so long that I have an extensive group of friends in the theater world. Uh, I have lots of friends in different parts of the planet uh, from childhood till now. They never leave. The good ones don't, <laughs> The good right, ones don't, right. yeah. And uh, I actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about your name for a second. It, it's very unique. <sighs> I know. Uh, it seems less and less unique as the years go by. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, and and it didn't seem unique in the music business. It only became a thing. I always said, I always say this, I didn't know I was short or had a weird name or any of that until I got into the musical theater. In the music business, I was tall and everybody had one weird name. Mine just happened to be real and on my birth <laughs> certificate. So I didn't know anything was strange. And I went to public school. So again, I didn't know I was different. Um, It was only when I got into musical theater that it started to be a thing. Um, And the whole like, who does she think she is? Why does she have one name? And what is that name? And how do you pronounce it? And blah, 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 blah. Um, I didn't know any of that was a thing until I was, you know, a grown up. Um, So 
imagine being different in, you know, pushing 30. <laughs> it, was, it was it was a bizarre thing. But uh, it, it's a name my mother made up. It's real. Um, it's my birth name. And uh, it's based on Black Orpheus the Opera. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, it, which is why it's spelled with an F E H instead of a P H E U. You know, it's not the Greek, it's Black Orpheus, right. which is F E U S. Right. You, you know, so there's so many different versions. It all goes back to the same story, basically. Yeah. But that's specifically the one she named me after is the opera. So, so. You, you said uh, that you and your siblings, how many siblings do you have? I have no siblings. Oh, I thought you said you, said you and your parents then would leave. Yeah, would leave yeah, the yeah. City. I, had, yeah. I was an only child oh. as far as I'm concerned. No. <laughs> as far as you know. <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no siblings. I was going to ask if uh, if they have equally amazing no, names No, my as siblings' well, but, names yeah. are Mary, Sue, and, and John. No, I, mean, <laughs> I have no, I have no siblings. Mary, Sue, John, and yeah. Orfe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So you said you said too that uh, you didn't get into musical theater until later in life. But when did you realize you had a gift for singing and a real passion for it? I, I didn't. I and I have said this before too, but I didn't know everybody didn't sing because I was singing probably before I spoke. You know, and every commercial on the television, every car ride, the radio, hot, you know, the top 40 radio. I knew every song. I knew every jingle. I knew everything. And I didn't know that everybody didn't belt at the top of their lungs to the point where, you know, my mother was like, you have to just be quiet. I didn't know that's not what everybody did. Uh, so I would say, if I'm really recalling like a cognizant memory, I would think from six years old on, hmm. I didn't know there was anything else. That that was always what I wanted to be. That's so what you, I always wanted to do. You wanted to, you always wanted to be a singer. Absolutely. I was singing into the hairbrush in my, you know, mirror for hours on end to any, you know, 45 my mother had in the house that I could get my hands on, you so, know. So then did you study music? No, I did. I never studied music. I actually studied acting um, deep method acting, Stanislavski, Lee Strasberg, all of that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, again, I didn't know. Obviously, I knew. I wasn't, you know, I saw the commercials for Evita and Dream Girls growing up, but I didn't know that that was something I could go and do. I just thought, I'm going to get a record deal. I'm going to get a record deal. I was very tunnel vision, single minded. You know, I went to performing arts. I got into music and art. It was further away at the time. The schools hadn't merged at that point in time. And I thought, well, this is closer. I can walk to performing arts. You know, I can walk to LaGuardia, actually. But uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't see that career. I just said, I want to be a pop star. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all I ever envisioned. That's all I ever dreamed about. That was my single-minded goal because I thought that's where I fit. You know what I'm saying? It mm -hmm. just, it seemed right at the time and still does. I, I still miss it every day. Um, I'm just grateful I still get to make my living as a singer, singer in front of a, a live audience, mm -hmm. you know. So tell me about your early career a little bit. What was Orrin Moore? Orrin Moore, gosh, <laughs> it's, I w went to performing arts. There were some of the most to this day brilliant um, musicians. We had a music department, an acting department, and a dance department at performing arts. And the musicians were brilliant. And there was this guy in the music department. He played the guitar, but you couldn't go to performing arts for guitar. You had to play the stand-up bass. Mm -hmm. So he played the stand-up bass at school. And another guy uh, who also played rhythm guitar would play the stand-up bass. So they were these brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, musicians in the music department. I was in the acting department with a couple of other guys who were really into music. You know, lively bunch of very talented people. I did get to get lucky enough to be with a lot of very talented people my whole life. And they put together a band called Geneva. And this was a hundred years ago. So they put together this band. It was like an R&B band. And they were like, we need a lead singer. <laughs> we need a girl singer. And I was like, okay. So one of the guys in the acting department with me he was the lead singer. He's like, well, I need a, you know, I need a girl to sing with. And my, you know, the guy who wound up becoming my partner for, you know, my whole entire music career in the music department, he was like, yeah, well, you know, he had a recording studio in his house. It was crazy. So we would just go after hours, you know, you're young, you don't need sleep, you don't need anything. We'd go to his house in Merrick, Long Island, and we would record song after song after song after song. 
And we would just cut demos all day, all night. It was a 24-hour endeavor. Were you writing it too at the same time? They were yeah. writing. I wasn't actually writing because they wouldn't let me write. They were like, no, 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 you just sing. I was like, oh, okay, cool, okay. I would do a lot of the vocal arrangements. I would do a lot of the background vocal arrangements. I'd do a lot of the vocal production, but, you know, you, you don't get credit for that. <laughs> you know, um, and make a very long story short, Geneva kind of disbanded and... I was the only one left. I didn't kind of run for the hills. And Geneva became Oren Moore. But before Geneva became Oren Moore, Geneva, with just the two of us, not the whole band, not all the guys, mm -hmm. put out a 12-inch single back when there were still 12 inches called Life in the Movies. And it got heavy club play. Johnny Dinell, who was the biggest DJ in the universe at the time, spun it. You know, David LaChapelle, who was not David LaChapelle at the time, took our album picture and all our, like, press shots. It was insane. And um, from then on, it took a few years to get the solo deal because that was just a one-off. It was, like, just a one-off. I'm mm -hmm. sure it was, like, a favor to somebody somewhere. I think my partner's dad knew the guy at the label. And um, I'm not – I'm specifically leaving out names on purpose but because <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants credit for it. But – we had this big 12-inch club hit, and then somehow we wound up, again, doing 300 demos. And I'm not making up a number. It was literally 300 demos. And we somehow, we got rejected by a ton of labels that I wish to this day hadn't rejected us because I really, again, to this day, wish we had been on Sony mm -hmm. with Tommy Mottola at the time. Uh, another smaller label uh, wound up passing on us. So we wound up with Ron Fair at EMI Records. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason we wound up with him was because he was really open and we were very young. He was very open to giving us full autonomy. So we wrote, we produced, we did all the arrangements. Mike practically, you know, played all the instruments. We had some fantastic uh, live, our whole CD was live. We were doing stuff that people didn't do, especially, you know, young new people didn't do, but he gave us a, a great deal of autonomy and um, Ron Fair then became Ron Fair many years later and went on to sign a bunch of people like us who had much, much more success, but they were us. So we kind of just had to sit back and go, wow, wow, she's in my clothes. She's in my hair. She's doing my songs. She's in my choreography and wow. costumes and everything. And, you know, I didn't talk about that for a good decade. I never said like, hey, so-and-so's me. You know what I mean? Because when you don't have the crazy success and you're on the precipice of that success, mm -hmm. you just look either crazy or really bitter. And I was neither. And I'm still neither of those things. It's factual. And um, a very good friend of mine, Ed Eckstein, he went out to dinner with Ron and he goes, you know, you, you, you get him talking and he admits that you were the template for every success act he had after that, you know. So... Make a long story longer. <laughs> uh, when I was on tour, we did, you know, we had a, a good amount of success for a very short amount of time. We had a top 40 single with a bullet on the Hot 100. The album was selling. We were opening up for very big acts at the time. So we were playing from anywhere from six to 30,000 kids a night. Wow. So we were, we were hot on the heels of becoming global sensations. And... The plug was pulled. Everything that went wrong, you know, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. We got completely screwed. Ron, like, just completely threw us under the bus. And we were so young, we didn't know how to kind of maintain and control and corral all of that from happening. We really, you know, nobody's mom was their manager. You know, we were just just out there naked, you know. But we had a troupe of dancers and background singers. I mean, you know, the label, to be fair, spent the money. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like a cheap, creepy tour. We were top of the line, you know, everything was fantastic. So somehow I wound up with my two male dancers, their, their gig immediately after the whole Oren Moore debacle, and we were on tour together, we were very close, you know, they became Broadway choreographers. They literally, their next big gigs, and they had, you know, these were guys who were dancers in every 90s video you'd ever seen from, you know, Sweat, with CNC Music Factory to snap the power. If you saw five people, 
they were in the video and they were my dancers. Right. Okay, so they were like the hot. I always went after the biggest, the best, the hottest of the time, which hence why David LaChapelle was my first photographer. Billy B was my first makeup artist. These are people who are legends now. Mm -hmm. I had a knack. Even as a teenager, I knew I had an eye. So Anthony Ciula was one of my lead male dancers. David Marquez was my other lead male dancer. Anthony Ciula calls me up one day and he goes, hey, I'm choreographing Footloose the musical. I was like, yeah, cool. Congratulations. He's like, no, no, no. I want you to come in and audition for it. They have a swing position. Mm -hmm. He might as well have been speaking another language to me. I didn't know what a swing position was. I didn't know what it meant to audition for a musical. I had no idea what he was saying. I was like, all right, you're going to have to really talk me through this. He's like, I'll just show up and bring your book. I thought he meant to bring a book to read in the waiting room. Right. Okay. And I'm going, bring my book book what do you what do you mean he goes you have to sing from a book I was like <laughs> I'm still like going like I'm going okay you have to really talk me through this and uh I happened to have uh Mariah Carey's 90 uh unplugged mm -hmm. she had made a book from you know a song book I was like oh, okay I'll take this I'll sing I'll sing if it's over so I went in in my best Rhythm Nation reject outfit. Like, <laughs> I, you know, you walk in and everyone's in point shoes and leotards with their hair back. I'm literally dressed like the girl who didn't get in the Janet Jackson video. Mm -hmm. And his choreography is hard. AC's choreography is treacherous. So I'm like in overalls and combat boots and my hat and my, you know, white tank top and all these girls are like, oh my God, what is this? Who is this? You know, these were not, you know, pop music fans. So they wouldn't have known, oh, you know, her song's on the radio 75 times a week. So I was just auditioned. I sang If It's Over by Mariah Carey. And by, I guess, five o'clock that night, I had an offer to be the swings. Did, still didn't really quite know what that meant. Mm -hmm. But basically what it meant was that I understudied every lead character, female lead character, the young ones, in the show. So Rusty, How many was that? Rusty, Wendy, Joe, Erlene, and Betty Blast. I didn't understudy Ariel. That was the only role I didn't understudy. The other female swing, my friend Janine, whom I'm still very close with, she understudied Ariel and all the adult women. I understudied every other female. Mm -hmm. So I had to know every other part in the show. Not the ensemble, but just the leads. Do you remember what you felt like the first time you had to go on? Uh, I In the nine months that I was in the show, I only ever went on once. No kidding. And with no prior notice, she just couldn't make it to the theater that night. And that track required roller skates, <laughs> a, a song. <laughs> so it was literally trial by fire. And I remember going... God, thank God I can roller skate. Like, that's really what came to mind. I was you, like, I'm you, not going to, you know. You didn't have a put-in or anything? No, no. because I, nobody knew she— First of all, that was not the part. That was literally the last part I ever thought I'd go on for. I thought I'd be Rusty because right. I was like the Rusty first cover. And uh, the girl who played Rusty never called out. She would show up with literally bronchitis and— you name it, if she could have had, if she could come on with a drip feed and an oxygen tank, she would. Like, nobody wanted me to go on for them. <laughs> so, because um, they knew I'd come from the music business, I could sing, whatever. I was like, you know, you have the job. It's not like they're going to say, hey, by the way, you're fired and we're going to put Orphe in the show from here right. on. It doesn't work that way. You can't do that. Um, so I went on. I immediately got my next Broadway show, who David Marquez, my other male dancer was choreographing. Intense audition period, major, all that. So I got to leave Footloose to do a musical called Fascinating Rhythm mm -hmm. that had these little known actors you may or may not have heard of, you know, Patrick Wilson, Sara Ramirez, you know, like the who's who of, you know, we were all in this crazy little cast that ran for 32 performances. It was one of the biggest bombs of the 90s in musical theater. Fascinating rhythm, funky hip hop, uh, R and B, cool versions of Gershwin tunes. <laughs> yeah, that went over really well. Greatest cast. While I was in there, little did I know that the entire time I was in there, I was pretty much auditioning to be in Saturday Night Fever, the musical. Same producers, same company managers, same everything. Mm -hmm. So basically, I did a thirty-two performance audition for Saturday Night Fever, and that's basically 
the longest story ever, but that's how I got on Broadway. I oh, know, it's beautiful. And then uh, you met someone else special. I in, did. Of course, in Saturday Night Fever. I did. All roads now have left, led me to, uh, led me to, Marrying Andy Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that uh, in a little bit, actually. But I want to ask you first, if, if even right now, do you still consider yourself uh, a recording artist that's on Broadway? Or do you consider yourself like a, a Broadway actress that writes music and you know, records I, music? I think if you asked anybody, I'm a Broadway star, I have to get over being reluctant about that. Why? Because I, I seem to still, I, I, I kind of, um, you know how you glorify the past? I'm not glorifying it because there was nothing great about the experience other than the experience. All the politics, all the stuff that happened to us, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't have been able to withstand any of it and kept going on in the entertainment mm -hmm. business. You know, I should have kind of been in a fetal position in the corner somewhere, you know, going, oh, what do I do now? But um, I... I Thankfully, I'm a type of person who doesn't let the grass grow under my feet, and I just keep forging ahead and forging ahead. But I consider myself a reluctant Broadway star and still longing for that big pop stardom, which clearly will never <laughs> happen. I'm never going to be that, which I had intended to be. But again, I'm very grateful that I was accepted into a world that still allows me to perform in front of a live audience singing. And thankfully, I've been able to do all the pop musicals. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? So I get to sing the way I sing. Um, I'm most likely never going to be hired to be in a musical like Les Mis. <laughs> you know, I'm not. Have you ever um, tried to sing that music? I can. Yeah. It's just that that's not what I'm known for. Right. And I, I think it would uh, take a little bit of a stretch of an imagination for the powers that be to go, oh, she has a soprano legit voice, and she can do this. I I'm also of a very specific mindset that you give the audience what they want. And I know, and I'm very in touch with my audience, I know what they want from me. I know what they want to hear from me. I know how they want to hear it from me. And I know the kind of roles that they want to see me perform in on Broadway. So I get, you know, I get slack for it, you know, now and again. Well, why do you always do these? You know, Kit's so much like Paulette. First of all, Kit is nothing like Paulette. For the record, let's set that straight. Not <laughs> at all. Um, but people know what to hire me for. People know what is going to sell tickets to a show that I'm in for, you know. Uh, so I'm really cool with that. And I, I just, I have to just get comfortable after 20 years. <laughs> this is this is what I'm mostly known for, you know. Mm -hmm. And so then... It, um Married to to Andy Carly in two thousand one, uh, he he told the story. Um, oh God! Yeah, he told the story of <laughs> the whirlwind of like all of a sudden you you blink twice and you're engaged and married. Um, do it's you, true. Do you enjoy? Uh, I guess I don't know if you're allowed to say otherwise. Do you enjoy being in the same industry as your spouse? Listen, let me tell you something. I, I, I can freely, honestly, with every ounce of truth in me, tell you that it is the greatest thing in the world to be in the same industry as Andy and in the same show. And we haven't been in the same show in a long time. But for us, we get along really, really well. We have an exorbitant amount of chemistry, which is not often the case with couples. Mm -hmm. You see a couple on screen and, oh, my God, you're like, oh, God, do they even like each other? Do they even speak when they're not, you know? But um, it's been a really, really wonderful thing. And I wouldn't... I, I wouldn't trade all the pop stardom success if it meant that I would have never met Andy. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So, because I, I think about that, again, going into my imaginary time machine, and people will say, well, what if you had all that pop success and then you'd never met Andy? So it's it's puts me right back into the <laughs> reality of the present, and I go, oh, yeah, you're right. That could have gone another way, you know, but mm -hmm. um, it's the greatest thing in the world. That's amazing. It's literally the greatest thing in the world. I, I don't have a magic formula for why it works. But like I said to you a little while ago, I have the same friends. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that uh, I, I'm, I have been gifted with, uh, I'm good at relationships, whether it's friendships, you know, 
got the same doctor, you know, voice doctor since I was 13, you know, like I, I have uh, an incredible amount of loyalty that I put out. So I think I get that back. You know, my best friend and I have been best friends every day for the past 8 billion years. And we haven't missed a phone conversation. You know what I mean? In yeah. 20 some odd years. That's, that's, uh, that's beautiful. He had a, his, his <laughs> eyes lit up when he told this, he told the story of how you guys <laughs> met. And I was like, oh yeah, they really like each other. Did he tell you he forgot all his lines? No. <laughs> <laughs> he went on with me. You know, he, he, uh, he was Joey. He came in as Joey in Saturday Night Fever. He yeah. took over for one of the leads and that track understudied Tony Monero. And he went on a lot, like four times a week. He was on as Tony Monero. He mm -hmm. was fantastic. He was fantastic. People were like immediately like, oh, who is this Andy Carl? He's amazing. The first time we got on stage together for him to play Tony, we have our big scene where he's teaching her the choreography and they're supposed to do the contest together. And like seconds later, he leaves and goes, I'm not doing it with you. I'm doing it with Stephanie. He literally forgot the entire scene. So I just did the whole scene as a monologue. No kidding. I swear it was this the funniest thing. And I was like, maybe this guy digs me. <laughs> 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 but it was great. It was great. I'll never forget it. And I will forever, ever be in debt to the, you know, the universe for putting me in Saturday Night Fever through the being in the 32 performances of Fascinating Rhythm and, you know, Manny Kaliditis for hiring me, Stigwood for hiring me. Stigwood handpicked everybody that was in wow. Saturday Night Fever. You had to audition for him. And so forever I'll be grateful because gave me my husband. It's amazing. And you also did Legally, Legally Blonde with him. I did. Um, Total fluke. They didn't want me for that show. Really? I was the very last person cast. How they did that didn't, work? They didn't want me for the, no matter what, Jerry Mitchell, he knows. He was like, nope, nope, all wrong, all, <laughs> all wrong. And Andy was like, and they had auditioned everybody. And I mean everybody from California to Chicago to Miami to New York. And they'd had various workshops with different Paulettes. And Andy just called Jerry and, and Jerry and Andy are very, very, very close friends. He's like, Jerry, I'm telling you, it's my wife. You've got to see her. And um, he finally was like, oh, okay, okay. I mean, because they had kind of struck out with everybody. And I walked into the room and I said, Celtic moods. And to this day, Jerry Mitchell's like, she said those two words and I knew that was Paulette. <laughs> uh, you got the Tony nomination in 2007 did, for, for that as well. And uh, did your career change? Uh, how did your career change, I guess, after after the nomination? Because now you're always Tony nominee, Orfe. Well, that's that's a, that's a probably the best thing about it is that no matter what else, if, if nothing else ever happens for the rest of time, I will always be able to have that as part of my, like, you know, whatever, legacy, for lack of a better word. Um, hey, you know, some things that I won't get into because it's too long. We don't have a lot of time. Some very strange things happened while I was in Legally Blonde. Very strange. Can't go into it. I'm not trying to tease you. But what could have and should have happened did not through a series of events mm -hmm. that, again, different day, different time, different conversation. But nothing, you know, look, sure, it certainly gives you a little bit more clout, a uh, little less auditioning for musical theater, it didn't change what I had to do outside of musical theater. You know, I still, on some occasions, a lot of um, a lot of indie films I've done that you'll probably never, ever see, I didn't have to audition for because people said, oh, I want the girl who's, you know, I want that girl with the weird name that's <laughs> in Legally Blonde. So it certainly put my legit career in a different mm -hmm. level, in a different place. There's only so many Tony nominees wandering the earth, you know. So it, it certainly changed the game for me, um, but didn't fast track me to anything else other than in the world of musical theater, which in and of itself is a, is a great thing. Um, I think what's cooler is that Andy and I are a Tony nominated married couple. I don't know how many more of those there are. I know Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, I think that's really cool. I just, I, you know, it didn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't hurt. It didn't, you know, get me a three-picture deal with, you know, Sony. Right. You know, Martin Scorsese didn't right. come rushing at my door. I wish he had. But um, 
it would it's it it's uh, it it can possibly be the gift that keeps on giving. Oh, I hope so. In not the sarcastic way. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz look, I mean Jerry Mitchell when he you know, option and knew he was going to do Pretty Woman. He called me up. He said, you can't say no. You're doing the show with me. Do you know what I'm saying? He's yeah, like, this yeah. is your part and you're doing the show. And he had always said, because we haven't, you know, Jerry and I haven't worked together in, since Legally Blonde. And he's like, the, when the next right thing comes along, you're going to do it with mm -hmm. me. I was like, I don't know if I'm doing musical theater ever again. You know, that's my thing. And he was like, you're doing this. He called me. And I've been with Pretty Woman since the very first half table reading going on almost three years ago. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize it took that long to uh, to bring it to the stage. Everything takes that long to bring to the stage. That's what people don't know about musicals. From inception to, hey, let's buy the rights to blah, 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 mm -hmm. till the night you see it on opening night on Broadway, there could be 10 years. This was a fast track. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, two yeah. years from the, the first table read to opening night, that's a fast track. There were musicals that made it to Broadway that I remember doing workshops for back in the early 2000s that didn't make it to Broadway till like 2010, 11, where you'd aged out of that part. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes they take forever. Sometimes they're like that. Sometimes lightning strikes, you know, mm -hmm. somebody fast tracks, somebody says we need this immediately, but... You know, think about how long Saturday Night Fever was in London before it ever got to New York, you know. Right. So was that Paula Wagner that, that fast tracked it? Pretty Woman? Yeah. I think, and this is almost um maudlin, and I don't mean it to be, I think the fact that Gary passed made it fast track a little bit more. Oh, right. Because I think the estate and his family were like, this was really his dream. Let's make it happen. Yeah. And you know, very logistically, you have to wait for a certain theater to be, you know, available. So you never know what's going to close. If you know you want a certain size theater, you have to wait for that theater. And again, you never know what the show in, you know, that's in that theater, if it's going to run 10 years or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So those are the logisticals behind stuff like that. But I think that Gary passing made made a little bit of a difference in how quickly it came to Broadway. Oh, well, I'm glad it did. And now you are too. Kit DeLuca. <laughs> um, and the, the stage character that you play seems to be more prominent in this version than it was in the in the movie. And um, I guess her dynamic with with the character of Vivian is a lot more matriarchal. Is that the word? Yeah, matriarchal. Uh, mentory, yeah. yes, absolutely. I think so. Uh, listen, I think part of the thing that Jerry and I had discussed at length was the fact that people wanted more of Kit in the movie. And J.F. and I, J.F. Lawton, who wrote the movie, who wrote the book for the musical, also said people would always tell him they wanted more of Kit. They wanted to know what happened to her. They wanted to know, I mean, the, the movie is so different than what it started out to be. It was a dark very gloomy kind of a movie that turned into Pretty Woman, the rom-com, you know. But we discussed it a lot, and I think that, again, you have a legacy that people are coming, oh, Orfe and Andy are in a show together. I don't think they wanted to come and see me do a cameo. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I think that they were very kind to me. The creative staff was very kind to me, and they made the part bigger, but to their advantage and to their benefit, you know. How much creative input did you have? A lot. For, yeah? A lot. Yeah. I, I, again, very lucky. And I, I think it comes from Jerry trusting me because he's very open to creative input. And that makes all the difference. He's one of those director who, directors who's like, if it's a good idea, it's not about, oh, I didn't come up with it, so we can't put it in the show. He's so collaborative and he's so creative and he knows a good idea when he hears or sees one. If it's good, it's going in the show. Like, that's the joke about Jerry Mitchell. Don't do it if you don't want it to get in the show. Like, if you do something and it's hard or it's really treacherous, don't do it because you're going to wind up doing it eight times a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, I, I'm very lucky that I wound up with this creative team. That's that's great. And outside of uh, musical theater as well, you still, you still, uh, you're doing solo work, yeah? I, and, I mean, you released a solo album in 2008. Yes, that was it, that was when I thought Legally Blonde would run a little bit longer and I could sell it in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> and just as my uh, CD came out, all the record stores started closing. So that was a bad timing as well. Um, I'm doing a lot more concerts with Andy now. 
So I think people started to kind of come around to thinking maybe we put on a good show together. Yeah. You know, I don't, we don't have as much time now, but it's still a big passion to do concerts. I love it. I love that whole world. I still, you know, enjoy it. And I enjoy working with Andy. I think our couple show is really funny and Legally it changes. Bound. Legally Bound is, yeah. you know, it's kind of, you can accommodate it to any venue and change the songs out. And, you know, it's, it's complete creative control, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed doing that a lot. And then you sang uh, a song on Michael Mott's album, Where the Sky Ends, which is ironic. I, I found that when I was researching for today and I was like, Michael Mott, I used to, I, I worked with that guy. And, uh, when Get he out I, of here, He really? and I were both at Bush Gardens oh, as, <laughs> in Williamsburg <laughs> as performers oh so God. many, so many years ago. Oh my God. So yeah. Hi, Michael. If you're listening to this. I'm sure he is. And he's probably uh, freaking out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great guy. Um, super talented. Um, I told you, I only know really super <laughs> talented people. It's kind of frightening. Yeah. Uh, and do you find yourself, you're still writing. Do you, you, yeah. do you find yourself pulling inspiration from recording artists versus Broadway artists or Broadway shows or anything? I mean, I don't know. Listen, again, I get to work with all these amazing pop writers, like, you know, from the Bee Gees to Brian Adams, mm -hmm. who's a mega, mega star, you know, with with a billion records sold and, you know, every song he's ever done, you know. Like, I wouldn't even have to look at a lyric. I, if he handed me a mic and said, sing this, I'd be able to sing it just because it's in my, you know, consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so I still... You know, I still pull from the pop world and the pop inspiration world. If I'm asked to write or produce for another artist, I don't know that anyone's going to call me and say, write a musical. It's not where my sensibilities are. I'm sure I could. It would be a harder stretch, I think. So, um, and I'm still really, I'm good at the production side. You know, um, I'm not... I will never consider myself this genius lyricist, but I'm a really good idea person. I'm a good, you know, uh, I can know what should be in the verse, what should be in the chorus, but my strengths are in the production, where the vocals should sit, what the arrangements should be, where the string line should be. Like, that's always been my forte. So, and you know, who knew? Do you play instruments? I play the piano and yeah. I play the drums. The drums, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good anymore. I don't get to practice, and that's one thing you have to practice. It's like use it or lose it. Right. But yeah, I, I am I am a trained pianist and a <laughs> drummer. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got you've got uh, your solo the solo sorry the um, you've got the solo work. Uh, you've you've got uh, musical theater. You've got um, the partnerships with Andy and others, and. It, and you do TV and film, and you've been on The Good Cop, Law and Order, Sex in the City. What what gets you excited? What do you what would what do you really like to do? Voiceovers. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, yes, um, yes. Voiceovers excite me. I'm I'm still hoping one day. Hollywood will go. Yeah, she should be an animated, you know, feature character in all of our Pixar and DreamWorks movies. Yes, um, that's what still gets me excited. But actually, everything gets me excited. Performing still puts the little bugs in my stomach, mm -hmm. and I still get really excited before the curtain hits and the first downbeat goes. And I am, I am absolutely still. It's like every day is like the first day. Anytime I get to perform, anytime. Seriously, yeah. Wow. I'm not a jaded old crow. So it's about it. So it's still it's still fresh. Eight shows a week. It's every show. Yes, is. because you have to remember. And people ask uh, people who do that a lot the same question: How do you keep it fresh? Well, every day there's twelve hundred to twenty five hundred new eyes in that you know sets of eyes in that yeah. theater. So you have to do it as if you've never done it before, because most of the audience has never seen the show before. Mm -hmm. I mean, Andy and I get a lot of repeat visitors, but. That's a cluster of people. The other umpteen hundreds and thousands of people have not seen this right. before. Right. So you have to play it for them. You know, mm. you have to play the material as if it's new every single time. And like with episodic television, it's always new. It's a different script every every episode. So that's in and of itself fresh off the, you know, off the bat. Um, so that's how I do it. That's new great. eyes. That's great. And and uh, do you do you get um, I ask Andy the same question. Do you have uh, 
any sort of reaction or do you get pumped or kind of like uh, obligatory feelings of or out, about going outside and meeting people at the stage door? I, I love the, the people that you know are literally, this is their special moment that they've come, they've flown in, they've come as a group, you know, excursion to come and see Pretty Woman or whatever musical they've come to see. And, you know, they go, oh God, can we wait and get autographs and things like that and take pictures? And it is probably the one and only time they're going to do this with that show. I'm very enthused by those people. And then, you know, we get some really great, sweet people, really polite people. Yeah, you get the random, not so fabulous people. And, you know, the um, uh, very ballsy people. <laughs> but it's like life. It's anything. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's anything. But I have generally, if you ask my fans, I, I don't really miss many stage door moments. I, I'm always out there signing. Uh, when, Wednesday matinees, I don't go out because I try to cram all the business I have to do in that day mm -hmm. so that I can go out the other seven times, you know, uh, or six times. But uh, no, it's, it's again... Hopefully it's a new group. <laughs> if it's the same people every night, it gets like, how many, how many playbills do you need signed? <laughs> you know, and they know that they know I'm like, you know, shady that way. I'm like, what is this your 19th autograph on, a, on the same play? You know, you walk out, like, you're like, Hey Mark. Yeah. yeah basically yeah. poor Mark. There's no marks, but yeah, <laughs> I won't say the names, but it's like, sometimes they know. And they, are you sick of me yet? I'm like, no, no, not yet. But are you just sick of me? You know, <laughs> Aren't you sick of seeing the same thing all the time? But uh, yeah, you get that. You get that's just the way that the culture is, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So uh, we'll wrap up here in a little bit, but I have a few standard questions. Okay. Um, so just very simply, what motivates you? Oh, music. Okay. Music in general. If you, uh, what advice would you give to your younger self and the younger people listening now starting out <sighs> down a similar path? Gosh, what would I give my... Um, there's so much advice I'd give my younger self, but mostly to really not care about things that aren't important. But you don't know that as a youngster. You think everything's life altering and important and, you know, the end of days. So I would kind of tell everyone to be very selective of what they waste their energy on being upset about. That's what I would tell my younger self and young people. And if you're getting into this business, you better have the thickest skin on the planet because it's not going to always be good. Mm -hmm. And last question, if you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what show would you see? Broadway show? Anything. Oh, my God. You mean other than Andy on Law & Order SVU? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind seeing, okay, we're going to go with the Broadway theme because that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd probably be able to see Dreamgirls a lot. Yeah? Yeah. Any particular cast or just the uh, OG going? cast. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Jennifer Holiday singing that song. Beautiful. Or Lilius White, actually, mm -hmm. which was the second. But yeah, that would be the one. Good, good choice. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, you want to plug yourself on on the socials? Yeah, man. Come follow me on Instagram because I really enjoy Instagram. I, Instagram. I'm just at Orfe on Instagram. Twitter is official underscore Orfe. And uh, yeah, check me out. Facebook is slash official dot Orfe. Yes. Is that you? Yes. And then YouTube is the official oh, Orfe. Oh, you guys, no. The YouTube channel is Orfe and Andy Carl. Oh. And it's a combined, it's a great channel and it has everything you'd ever want to see including like things you probably I shouldn't probably have on the channel like bootlegs basically <laughs> so you should definitely definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel because I don't promote that very much and buy the CD Legally Bound yes uh, well thank you thank you so much for coming thank you so uh, much again uh, I'm Alan Seals this has been another episode of the Theater Podcast um, I am on the Instagram and Twitter as well as at theater underscore podcast. Woo! And of course, big thank you to our friends, as always, Jukebox the Ghost for this lovely intro and outro music. Please subscribe, share, tell your friends, Woo! talk about everything, talk about Orfe, talk about oh, yes. Pretty Woman the Musical. <laughs> and thank you again. Thank you for having me. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.